Just in case we are live. Are we live? Yes, we are live. Welcome back to my art studio where I am working on my elasomorph and uh, today's task is quite simple. We're only working with um, olive green and we are interested in um, building up the pattern of the hummingbird feathers. Okay, so uh, in your absence, I've been quite busy. I used yellow ochre to build up this area here. Then I used burnt umber to create a transition from dark to light. And in this transition, I used the tip of my brush to scrape into it in a technique known as scrafito, so that's S-G-R-A-F-I-T-T-O, scrafito, and scrape back through the dark layers into the light layers and give this gentle transition from dark through to light. Also, similarly, on the um, paint palette here, I've used a little bit more of the yellow ochre and I also used the burnt umber to draw in the kind of texture that I like to create on the palette, the kind of wooden um, uh, yeah, the kind of texture, the pattern, the design of the grain of the wood on the palette. Yeah. Also experimented with a little bit of burnt umber here to knock back the black and also on the fingerboard of the guitar and what I noticed was the brown layer that I put on from the burnt umber um, made a nice addition so that when I scraped back using the scrafito technique it showed up the earlier black as having a blue cast and uh, I quite like that blue bias that we have on the fingerboard especially on the ebony wood so for me I think that was a success also I used a little bit of burnt umber here to modulate the side of the guitar from just uh, the black that we made from French ultramarine blue this one and burnt umber uh, when I added burnt umber just uh, plainly to it, it, it kind of softens it, makes it a little bit more interesting, gives it a little bit of visual interest. Also, burnt umber was used to create the texture of this branch. Now, what I've tried to do is suggest areas where the bark has either peeled back or there's spaces here where mosses and lichens and... Um, those kind of things can grow on a branch. Now, since we're speaking about Costa Rica, it's not likely to be lichens or mosses. The equivalent would be epiphytes like bromeliads and other kind of um, plants which like to grow on top of other plants. And so I've created a separation between the branch itself and the things that may be growing on the branch round about here. So that's quite interesting. Here what I've done is I've put down the first layer of burnt umper very, very heavily. And again, I've used the scrafito technique to scratch back through to the original stain, the original stain which you can see here. Scrape back and give that lovely kind of scalloped uh, gorget which um, hummingbirds seem to enjoy. Okay. I was intending on using French ultramarine blue to knock this further back to a black so that when I added brighter colours like this red here, 
uh, once I um, introduced those colours, I could scrape back through them again and reveal this black area as outlining the colours. But that's yet to be decided. The last thing is I finally resolved upon what this pouch element would be here. I'm looking at a lock uh, that is somehow attached to the hummingbird from this kind of strap here. And uh, the lock incorporates a keyhole which is in the shape of a pawn chess piece. Um, I don't know why, but it's just the, the idea kind of presented itself to me. So the keyhole is also pawn shaped. And so I'm going to try and develop that idea a little bit more. Finally, burnt umber was included with some titanium white to make a kind of dull grey. And this dull grey was used to model the form of the feathers of the body of the bird, the area which is commonly known as the vent of the bird, and the underside of the fork tail. The wing itself is going to be left for a while because there is a particular detail about um, the wing which I want to try and replicate. When people paint hummingbirds, they miss this, and I think it deserves you know, some consideration just on its own. So that is what I've done uh, since the previous episode, the previous installment of my live streaming. Now what I want to do is I just want to have um, a time to use olive green, which I'm mixing up in the palette here. You can see it now. Uh, to make the scalloped effect, which is one of the delights of the hummingbird. One of the things I really about, like about um, hummingbirds in particular is that their feathers make a lovely kind of scalloped, kind of seashell kind of shape, a pattern. And um, it's something I just really appreciate about them. Now, also what I've noticed about hummingbirds is the iridescence of the hummingbird is due to the fact that um, raw, untreated colours sit on a bed of either dull greys or browns, <coughs> and that allows a contrast to be seen between them. And that is one of the elements, the features of a hummingbird is that um, the contrast between the raw colours, the raw, pure, unmixed colours, and these kind of um, desaturated colours, and all of it is a kind of pre-mixed green, which is already desaturated from a primary colour. So what I'm going to do here is try and create the kind of scalloped effect, and each one of them, each one of these feathers is almost like an inverted teardrop. And so this is going to be a lot of repetition. Okay. So what I'm going to try and do is add kind of feathers in the style of scales. And they follow a particular direction, which is uh, quite noticeable. It's almost mathematical in the birds. And it's something I just really appreciate about them. Is this kind of scaling effect that they have. It is clear that in the hummingbird, the scaling effect... Oops, the scaling effect uh, travels in one direction only. So where does the teardrops will appear as, you know, um, upside down here, 
Let's try this one. What will happen is as we follow the contour or shape of the curve of the hummingbird's skull, um, the pattern is going to invert fairly soon. So this kind of teardrop shape here has the narrow end at the bottom widening to the uh, the kind of fattened apex okay but once we travel around the skull this pattern or shape is going to invert and become upside down um, but it is a it is a regular like I say one of the things I just admire about it I like about it is that it's mathematically precise it's almost mathematically correct and so uh, you can see that the scaling effect is offset from each layer which is added of course you'll find that you know in in anything there is um a little bit of irregularity because we're dealing with you know living things organic things but within that, we do have this kind of patterning, this kind of detailing, which is um, like tiling. It's just so, pre so precise. Now that a last uh, addition of water has proved to be uh, useful in turning the paint into quite a inky workable paint there there we go so when we think about a lizard and we think about the scales we can know that um, we can imagine that the you know what the scales are on a lizard it's a kind of tiling effect which is fairly regular and predictable so as you can see, we're coming from the front of the beak up over the crown and towards the nape. And the pattern that we've established is going to invert as we come round this crown and begin to travel up the wing. This is my first time using the using uh, olive green on its own. I have previously used it in combination with uh, the burnt umber that I was speaking about earlier. Let's see where the skull comes in there. Another thing about hummingbirds, and I really do admire them, is that they're very dapper, they're a very neat bird, very tidy. And so the outline that we're trying to establish is um, quite a neat one. There, there we see. There's no record of the first performance of Handel's eternal source of light divine, but it was clearly intended for Queen Anne's birthday. Well, whether or not she ever actually heard her birthday ode, Queen Anne granted Handel a pension of £200 a year for life. Pension, really? That's a nice thing. <laughs> be nice to have a pension. And okay. There we go. That's the pattern established. Uh, I'm just using water as my mixing medium. So this is what we would call the kind of lean stage. Uh, in the last 
kind of episode. I mentioned fat over lean as a principle that they use in oil painting. Okay, and even as we transition onto the shoulder of the bird, the pattern is still established. We still continue with the scalloped pattern. Now, if we wanted to be lazy about it and not adopt a kind of teardrop shape, uh, we could simply add dots or dollops or, you know, an approximation of the pattern that it is that I'm speaking about. But I'm trying to maintain this um, kind of pattern even as it narrows down as the shoulder moves away from the head out towards the tip of the wing. Uh, this brush is a rigger from Rosemary & Co. And uh, it holds a lot of paint. But even with that, what happens is uh, I do need to reload the brush quite a lot. You'll also notice that I get distracted from my own ideas very quickly. And so you must forgive me for that. Eventually, the pattern becomes so small that um, it gets lost and can become a line. Okay, so there we have the scaling of uh, this particular hummingbird. Now, um, what I want to do is I want to put a shadow, but a broken shadow under the strap that holds the uh, padlock in place. I'm noticing that the green is lovely, it's deliciously dark compared with the burnt umber. And so I'm just going over the keyhole detail with this dark, trying to nudge it back a little bit. A little bit under the wing where it overlaps the body. And this part here is the equivalent of the armpit here. So this area here is a little bit darkened and shows where the wing muscle connects with the bones holding the feathers out. Okay, that's good. I'm happy with that. Additionally, on the back, the patterning continues. The teardrop con uh, shape continues. But becomes lost and diminishes into the side of the body. I've seen hummingbirds with a reddish brown pattern here, which is something that I'm keen to introduce because that reddish brown will be the complement of this olive green. Uh, plus, once I add the um, really bright colours, the yellows and things that create the iridescence. It will be a nice dark bed on which to set those um, strong accent colours. There is a sense in which the way that I'm painting right now, uh, at this particular moment in time, is a reminiscent of folk art. Because what I'm doing is um, simplifying forms but also uh, at the moment I seem to be enjoying um, 
unmixed colours from the tube. But right now I'm at the block in stage, uh, which I've been at pains to describe. I'm at the block in stage, and uh, I haven't really fully resolved in myself uh, what the results of this work are, are going to be. So it's as much um, a journey of discovery for myself as it is for anybody who is watching uh, this particular blog or you know live streaming. Right, I've tried to create a shadow under the uh, padlock here to make that pop. But the shadow has extended too far into the body. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and use the scrofito technique to scrape back some of that material. Some of it will be removed and some of it will be incorporated into what is already there. And so scrofito is, um, I'd have to say, it's a char characteristic feature of my work is that I use the scrofito technique. There is a junction here between the right wing and the left wing, which needs to be identified. There it is there. So by darkening the right wing, we bring the left wing, the one that's nearest towards us, into relief. Okay. And again, the patterning continues. This kind of scalloping effect. But I need it to be very dark where that separation is, that junction is. It has to be dark so that uh, we can make sense of it. It becomes legible when we try to look at it. I know that this part of the wing travels towards the secondary feathers and also out towards a kind of a little ridge there which forms the shoulder. So this is the shoulder element which we see here but on the opposite wing. The fact that it's broken will make the the broken nature of iridescence um, easier to establish. Okay. Some details have become lost, so with a little bit of water and a lot of mixing, I want this to be inky and workable enough so I can draw. As I'm mixing, I'm rotating the brush to try and bring it into a point. And this is the outline of the underside of the feathers. And I'm deliberately creating a line, but a broken line, which suggests the outside or leading edge of the feathers. Uh, quite deliberately so. There we go. And there should be one maybe about there. Okay. Because the feathers themselves are made up of individual hairs, which are, I can't remember if they're barbs or barbules or such. But it just reminds us that the, the origin of the feather is similar to that of the hair. The feathers are made up of individual strands. Now I'm actually enjoying the scalloping texture 
or the, ta the scalloping pattern that we've established. So I'm keen to go over to the gorget again and pick out the individual scallops uh, which were established in um, burnt umber. And the addition of the olive green will darken but also enrich that area um, because principally the uh, gorget is going to be made up of reds, crimsons and uh, this green, this kind of nudge towards green is the complement of those colours and so even although these will be you know, partially obscured. Uh, I'm hoping that we're going to enjoy some of the contrast or variety of colour that the complements of red and green are going to bring to that area. So already for me that seems a whole lot more interesting than before. Some here a little bit has been lost here but if I do this it gives a little bit of shape and form to this area that means once again that the scalloped form is being re-established so that gives us one of the elements of art the idea of um, pattern so it re-establishes the idea of pattern but also in terms of color it allows me to create a contrast a juxtaposition between um, Uh, complementary colors, uh, complementary colors on the uh, color wheel. I'm now curious as to how well the green will work as a leading edge to the mosses. And I am noticing that there is a bit of an impact. Yep, I do like that. That was unexpected. Yeah, this is a bonus. So, in terms of learning, because as we paint, we should learn from each um, encounter that we have with a work. Is I'm going to make a mental note that this olive green uh, tends to accentuate the burnt umber. And it's quite possible I'm going to paint another elasomorph and that elasomorph may include um, you know branches. So I've now learned that olive green and a uh, burnt umber are very good bedfellows. But we'll have to hold back on a judgment about them because uh, of the notion of colour shift. Um, is that, you know, as dark colours dry, they become lighter. As light colours dry, they become darker. So, but I'm optimistic that um, this is actually helping, given helping to give depth to the artwork. And so much now, I want to actually incorporate it into this little detail here. 
to the sound hall, uh, sorry, the uh, thumb hall of the mixing palette. Is it Delius? I wonder if we're talking about Delius right now. Now, in terms of guitar wood, the um, the sides of a guitar are often made of things like rosewood, uh, Indian or Brazilian rosewood, and they can have lovely olives and reds in them and additionally the fingerboard uh, for those of us that play guitar we know the ribbing that is characteristic of ebony uh, if you have an ebony fingerboard so both my uh, guitars both my classical guitars have ebony fingerboards and I'm aware of that uh, kind of detailing. Lastly, we have the area round about the eyeball, which is actually the area which constitutes the ear. This area here. Now let me just check. This is a two, so I'm going to move over onto the smaller rigger and instead of scalloping this area here is characterized by um, a kind of um, hair like it's not so much well it's scalloping but with a kind of broken edge So there we go. So it's a very kind of broken line until we reach this area here at the the leading edge of the beak and heading towards the eye and the eyebrow. This area here can be darkened, given a kind of uh, sort of angry look. Uh, but I have seen the hummingbirds. I've been lucky to feed hummingbirds by hand in Costa Rica. Uh, on Mount Verde. And it's um, characterized by a kind of broken hairiness. And so, now that we know what we've done here, the teardrop pattern has traveled up from the nose area, which I think is called the sear which is C-E-R-E, -E, this area here, up over the crown, and this inverted teardrop becomes a kind of, um, you know, a correct teardrop pattern on this side, travelling up through the shoulder to the wingtips, and here as well. So what I need to do is do something similar with this bird which is nesting in the sound hole of the guitar. Yeah, don't ask me why. There we go. Now because this is a smaller area, I can get more coverage out of a single um, loaded charge of the brush. 
It may look as dots, but I'm trying to respect this kind of teardrop shape, this kind of scallop shape. So it's scalloped. Fat at the apex and shallower towards the tip. A detail I wish to include is an eyebrow. I want to give each of these hummingbirds an eyebrow. So here the pattern becomes inverted. What we probably describe as the correct way around. Yeah, and much more easier to uh, create. Yeah. I, I appear to be having a visit to my art studio. Uh, I need you to know that I am live streaming. So I'm happy if you're happy. Okay, and now this area here, which is the eyeball leading towards the ear area, it's very, very small, but I am trying to in incorporate this um, uh, this kind of patterning that I mentioned before in the previous bird. So, there we are. Um, I am quite happy with that. I'm beginning to really enjoy this olive green and the darks it can give me. So if I put that there, I'm just wondering how much separation I can have with this branch in the foreground and this distant, um, I don't know, it looks a little bit like a wheat field, but it's a wheat field which it uh, has a similar kind of appearance to the mixing palette over there. One thing I forgot to mention is that with the stepping stones, the stepping stones which are in the E minor, uh, sorry, E major, A minor shape. So uh, this is the E major shape, two, three, one, two, three, one for uh, a minor shape where given a treatment of the burnt umber mixed with titanium uh, placed on top and then scraped back again scraped off to try and um, give this kind of um, textured kind of rocky surface so, uh, there's only one thing else I can think of before we end the session today, which is to try and see what effect the olive green has on the shadow area of the sound hole here. I'll just incorporate it in there. And so, uh, with my preference for working wet on dry uh, I quite like the uh, effect of um, optical color mixing I've mentioned optical color mixing before it's where the colors are mixed on the retina as we perceive color rather than mixed on the palette. So at the moment, my painting seems to be preferring this notion of optical color mixing through glazing multiple layers. Uh, these brushes do give a lot of mileage with the line work. So I am not sponsored by rosemary brushes, but I really do like them. And so you can get them from Rosemary and Co. So that's Rosemary and Co. 
dot uk and order them online and uh, they will arrive at your door and they are reliable uh, i'm not sponsored by them at all other brushes are available i've used other brushes before like the i think it's dale or rowney dale or rowney system three brushes for acrylic are very enjoyable to use as well but i have been asked um after the purchase of these brushes to provide feedback on them and i will say that they have good bellies they've got good color retention they deliver a really good uh, amount of paint to the surface so i can make decent line uh, line work is very important for me um, and they maintain a very fine point which is um, uh, a nice factor i'm now tempted to try and draw in some of the feathering i think i want less paint on there so i'm looking for more of a dry brush here to show where the principal feathers meet. I don't mind if I get a broken line. That's important to me because um, feathers are not uniform. The webbing on them, which is created by barbs and barbules, does have a tendency to break. And that's why birds preen. They try and re-establish them. But I can use that detail to give visual interest to the art that I produce. Uh, so I'm just drawing in what I've um, introduced by Scrafito. I've kind of embossed this area so that as well as being able to see uh, this detail, I can actually feel it as well. Can we see that? I wonder. Yeah, let's see if we do that. Okay. I'm following areas that I've embossed before. And this is just so that I can see them because uh, you know I will be working on these areas again. But there is a detail about uh, the wings which I'm gonna try I'm gonna try to establish in my own work, artwork because I notice it's absent in a lot of um, uh, other people's work. Uh, people who paint hummingbirds. Uh, treat them as a kind of decorative subject. Now I'm trying to see here, the line has vanished. So I'll try and establish that. So probably the next time we meet, I'll be here uh, focusing specifically on uh, the problem of hummingbird wings. There's a specific kind of feature of the wings which reminds me of the traceries in stained glass windows. And that they're very heavily lined. Let's draw in this detail here, the thickness of the padlock, there, just there, there, okay. Improvisations on the organ were legendary, and audiences came from far and wide to hear him play. His dexterity. 
austerity was highlighted during a performance of Handel's Te Deum. Stanley suddenly realized, just as he started playing the organ, that the instrument was a semitone sharp compared to the rest of the orchestra. In a heartbeat, without hesitation, he transposed the organ part from D to C sharp major and saved the day. A good many of Stanley's compositions have survived, and here is a really lovely yeah. example. Uh, the eyebrow is lost in the other lesser hummingbird and so I'm going to try and bring that in there we go plus that little dark area which appears just where the beak meets the eyeball hmm Okay, I'm happy with today's work. I am grateful uh, for anybody who is watching these. And I would like to thank you for continuing to view uh, these um, live streaming sessions from my studio practice here at my home uh, north of Inverness. So wherever you are, uh, I hope this has been useful to you, informative to you, and will go some way to encouraging creativity in whatever form that takes. Thank you again for watching. Uh, see you in the next one. Bye-bye.